Today, I would like to introduce um, Unbounded Capital's newest advisor, Mike Siegel. He's been with us uh, for a number of months now, and myself and the whole Unbounded team saw him just as recently as about a month ago in New York City, where he graciously flew from his home in Lisbon to give a talk and attend our annual summit in Manhattan. And he gave a talk on what VCs really think. And as someone who's been a successful, not just venture capitalist himself, but also a founder, been, you know, kind of on all sides of the table and now is maybe hovering over the table or whatever <laughs> analogy you want to use there, very well qualified to give this talk. And this is a no holds barred about VC. Uh, it's also, you know, as is in line with our culture at Unbounded, it's not even a talk where myself or the other partners necessarily agree with every point of it, but it's a uh, very intellectually stimulating, valuable learning experience to listen to this if you have not yet had the pleasure. So without further ado, I will let Mike uh, share his screen and, and take it away. Super. Thank you, Zach. And hello, everyone. Uh, let me hit the screen share there. There we go. Okay. So these are the slides that I shared at the um, at the Unbounded Capital Summit. Um, and this is sort of an adaptation of a deck that I typically use with um, groups of founders to try and help them unpack the sort of unspoken uh, behaviors that they see and experience as they're going out and trying to raise capital. Basically, I try and rebalance the scales on behalf of, of the entrepreneurs so that they at least understand what's going on, if not um, actually you know, be more successful. Um, and I invite you all to go ahead and ask me questions and challenge me uh, along the way. Um, uh, so to give you a bit of background on myself, uh, Zach mentioned I'm a multiple time entrepreneur. I've raised capital a couple of times. One of my companies was acquired and I was a senior executive through um, the acquirer's IPO, which was a pre-Sarbanes-Oxley thing for those of you who remember that. And it's something I hope never to repeat again. Um, starting in 2012, um, the organization SWIFT, the global payment network, found me and asked me to help them try and figure out how to begin bridging gaps between their, call it top 500 member banks and startups, which weren't yet called fintech startups. Um, so I ended up helping them establish a program to do that where we had companies like TransferWise, NowWise, and Revolut, and Duo Security, and Ripple, and a bunch of others launch. Um, I went from there after getting through thinking I was going to do another startup, would have been my eighth. Um, I joined 500 startups to help uh, run their FinTech Accelerator and Fund. Uh, from 2016 to 2019, we, we invested in 88 companies in 26 countries. Um, and that's now a top decile performing fund. And that was until three weeks ago when one of our investments became a unicorn. Um, during that period, I also roped a bunch of the banks and insurers that I had met through SWIFT into a community um, that could give feedback to our um, to our companies uh, as they went through their pre-seed and seed stages. That turned into a consulting practice where I helped um, banks and insurers figure out how to do innovation and investment and partner with fintechs, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, and along there, I started consulting to the national payment rail in Canada, who was getting ready to do a real-time um, rail rollout, wanted to start promoting it. And I ended up turning that into a not-for-profit trade organization called 2022 Labs that was designed to promote faster and data-rich payments. Uh, realized in 2019 that I didn't really like being a VC. And so since then, I've been advising both founders and emerging fund managers. So today I um, am an advisor, a venture partner, or an IC member at a bunch of different organizations. Um, SVB Capital is wrapping up. Um, uh, I was the uh, board member, outside board member for their European 
fund of funds, which was sort of a, an aborted effort. And, and really, if you look across my entire portfolio of activities, a lot of it has to do with how in this next phase of, of um, uh, the market cycle, we're going to see fintech finally begin to approach um, low disrupting capital markets. So when I start this talk um, for entrepreneurs who've not been through this before, I always like to help them understand what the business model of the people they're trying to sell their equity to is. And that's VCs, which go out and they raise money from limited partners. They invest in startups. Hopefully they show returns and then they go out and do it again. And I like to remind them that the business model of these kinds of relationships are carry plus management fees. And that it, within that model, given that a fund is generally raising or a fund platform is generating a new fund um, about every three years uh, and early stage investments take a little bit of time to mature and hopefully exit, that early stage VCs have to make investments that can return multiples, generally at least 3x, of their fund within seven to 10 years in order to justify the, the um, illiquidity of the venture asset class. So if the company that they are working on isn't going to get to scale, and generally as a marker, we pick 100 million ARR within seven to 10 years, such that it can create an exit that will return a whole fund multiple times over, that they really shouldn't be talking to VCs. And many at, the, at this point, many entrepreneurs I talk to kind of go away and think about other ways to capitalize their business. The next thing I point out is that over 99% of all early stage investments fail to generate reasonable returns for the investors. Um, and this has proven itself out um, probably time and time again, for the last four, five, or six market cycles. Now, when you think about who a VC is as a person, I like, I like to bring this all down to, to behavioral economics, um, human factors. This is often what a VC looks like. They, you know, maybe they've been an entrepreneur before, maybe they've been a banker before. Um, one way or another, they have a pretty um, expensive lifestyle with lots of kids and lots of helpers and a partner that may or may not actually earn at the same level as the VC hopes to, but still likes the nice lifestyle. And that often most of any wealth that they've generated has gone into their GP commit. So these are people who have a very high burn rate. Um, they're working in a business that fails most of the time to generate returns. And so they have to deal with that sort of um, a dissonance between between those two ideas. And so in reality, what VCs invest in are things that make it easier for them to raise their next fund. Because more often than not, VCs live from management fee to management fee rather than from exit to exit. The best ones live from exit to exit, but most of them live from management fee to management fee. I also like to point out that in order to raise money from LPs, just like entrepreneurs are told, they have to generate traction and they have to show that they've taken risks off the table. Well, VCs also have to demonstrate traction in order to get LP investments. And depending how early a fund they are and whether they're talking to LPs that like investing in emerging managers, first or second time fund managers, or like investing in you know, much more established funds, that's going to impact which um, KPIs for traction are going to be most relevant. So the ideal situation is when a fund has uh, realized three um, X or more DPI. Doesn't always happen, but that's sort of the gold standard. If you've not been around long enough, if you're an early stage fund, this was my case at 500 startups, investing in pre-seed and seed, right? Again, exits looking to be seven to 10 years out, 
the best you can show is that you've done markups. LPs typically like to see that those markups come from name brand VCs who have a, a real interest in pushing up the valuations of the companies and getting their exits in a much shorter time frame. Um, LPs typically like to see that uh, a, a start or a fund participates not in the tenth deal in a given market segment, but rather the hottest deal and preferably the first or second one that to come down the pipe. And finally, we, we always talk to entrepreneurs and they're like, well, the VCs, they're just mining me for information and I'm a little nervous about giving it to them because I think they're going to take it and give it to their to competitors. But the reality is that VCs like to appear like these magical money fairies that know everything about what's going on in the market. And the only way that they can do that in front of LPs is to have lots and lots of data about what entrepreneurs are working on and how they're doing and what revenue uh, growth rates look like and what you know um, payback time on customer acquisition looks like. So all of these metrics. So in fact, what I point out to the entrepreneurs is they're not mining you to give your money or your data to competitors. They're mining you to give your data LPs so that they look smart and can go close their next fund. At the end of the day, what VCs really want to know about the startup that they're talking to across the table is, you know, given where this company is, given the total size of the market, if things go well, will the percentage of the company I'm buying today return 3x my entire fund? And if the answer is no, I really shouldn't be talking anymore. And if the answer is yes, then maybe I'm going to be interested in competing for this deal. Despite the marketing about how much support a fund gives an entrepreneur in guidance, advice, network connections, help hiring, strategy, access to, to um, capital equipment or relationships that they couldn't otherwise get, VCs, it's not that they're lazy, but they don't really have the time to spend a lot of energy on startups because they're always trying to talk to their real customers who are the LPs. And so they're really asking themselves whether this entrepreneur that I'm talking to is one that I'm going to have to spend a lot of time in to, to get the kinds of results that I think they can get. And generally speaking, VCs always prefer, unless you're a studio or an accelerator, VCs don't want to invest in companies that are going to take a whole lot of work. When we talk at early stage about a team, right? The advice usually given to entrepreneurs is you have to have a great team. You have to have a great team. Really what you have to have is a great CEO. And what makes a great CEO in this, in this world is someone who can sell, someone who can recruit people to their vision, someone that can bring in early customers, and most importantly, someone who can sell to investors. Because ultimately, if a company can't go from round to round to round, then my investment at this stage is toast. They're also thinking about the optics. How does this look? How would the doing this deal look to my LPs when I'm doing my quarterly reporting? And based on the growth curve of this company, based on what's going on in the market, will this company, my investment in this company, the stories I can tell about it, will it support the raise of my next fund? Will it um, reinforce or justify the thesis that I'm going to LPs with? Are there any questions to this point that anyone wants to sort of dig into or, or push back on or anything like that? Um, I can definitely go. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just want to preface by saying, like, I definitely understand this is true for the vast majority of VCs. And, you know, some of this is definitely even true for unbounded capital. Um, and I think arguably true for every single venture capital firm, no matter how much they try to avoid, you know, some of the dynamics that you're talking about, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. and there's kind of this different, you know, what's very interesting for the business of VC is that the a lot of the short term and long term incentives are just so out of whack and kind of the opposite where for most other businesses that's not really the case where 
you have a short-term incentives that is X and long-term incentive is the opposite of X. Um, so, but yeah, I guess my question is just like, to what degree do you think not succumbing to some of these things where the end result is basically, actually, we don't spend a lot of time making investment decisions. We don't spend a lot of time helping our startups. Uh, what are some maybe examples of firms you see successfully do that? Like, how do you think firms are able to not succumb to those dynamics and still run a good business? And as you know, that's certainly been a standard that we've tried to hold ourselves to and unbound and that we intend to, you know, be even better at moving forward as we've, you know, been around for longer and ideally get to spend rest time, less time fundraising than in the past. So let me, let me repeat back the question to make sure I understand. Um, what examples are there of firms who have been very successful at bucking these dynamics, if you will? Yeah, so I guess it's kind of a two-part question. That's one, and then, like, based on what you know about the firms that have successfully navigated that, how might other firms be able to be more aligned with the startups that they invested and spend more time helping them? Um, so VC, you know, is a product like any other, and you ultimately, you need to decide what you're going to hang your hat of differentiation on and, and what you're going to go ahead and, and take the commoditized view of, um, all good firms do a good job of doing diligence around the things that they believe are going to be indicative of, of generating value. Um, firms that have done a great job, for example, on supporting startups have gotten themselves to a scale where they can um, invest in specialists for supporting startups. And I'm going to give you sort of an outsized example, but if you look at Andreessen Horowitz, which has sort of been, you know, the, the poster child of building larger and larger funds um, and, and effectively taking steps towards, you know, becoming more of a hedge fund with hedge fund style returns than a venture fund. Um, they, I think the last time I looked, had close to 50 people in recruiting, in HR and recruiting. So they, as a, as a fund, have sort of single-handedly dismantled executive recruiting in Silicon Valley. And so they cannibalized one industry and, you, you know, so are supporting their own business model with yeah. having built a really large team. Um, a much, you know, sort of uh, earlier example of that was first round capital. Right. First round, Josh Koppelman did an amazing job and Howard Morgan did an amazing job picking companies in early days, um, got their fund to a manageable size and then found a bunch of interesting high leverage ways, for example, tapping the very large community of CEOs they invested in to be mentors and provide advice back to um, uh, back to their portfolio. Um, when at 500 startups, right, we already had a pretty large support infrastructure because at the time I joined, we had, I don't know, 2,200, 2,400 portfolio companies globally. And, um, right, I had to invest in, in eight to 10 companies uh, every six months. But what I had to build that, that 500 startups didn't need was that support infrastructure to provide care and feeding for fintech companies that most other companies don't need, right? Compliance, help, and how do you build a balance sheet and, and these kinds of things. And I managed to rope them in um, successfully and we were both the most active and at the time, most successful fintech investor in the world. Um, so I think it's, it's choosing your battles and then making sure that you choose them in such a way that you are getting access to deals in a preferential way that no one else can, right? And if I, if I look back at, at my own experience with 500, um, we, are, we, right, we had a very standard investment program that would put 
150 grand into a company for five uh, for six percent, which is imputed valuation of two and a half million. The average entrepreneur that took our deal already had a 5.5 million valuation. And the way that we sort of made the argument was, well, first of all, you're getting access to things like lots of money from Amazon and Google and, and um, um, <clears throat> Microsoft for your cloud hosting and all of this other software over here and all of these professionals who are growth hackers and all of these kinds of things. And so your capital requirements coming into our program is going to be much less than they otherwise would. Um, and second of all, we're the only program out there at this stage that gives you access to lawyers and payment professionals and, and uh, lenders and all the other things that, um, that uh, uh, fintech companies need that others don't. Oh, and by the way, we actually are fintech specialists. We've built fintech businesses. We've worked with banks. We've done all these kinds of things. And the net result of that was we had a 98 NPS score. Um, the only way we ever raised money for our fund was by introducing our entrepreneurs to our, our potential LPs, which created obviously a lot of leverage. And during the three years I was there, we never once lost a deal to Y Combinator. So it's, you got to pick your differentiation. You got to be known as, as the world's best at that. And that's the thing you decide to invest in. The measure then is, are you getting all the deals that you know are within your thesis as a result of how you've chosen to differentiate? Long-winded, you know, answer, but there you go. When I look at, you know, what I've seen the team at, at Unbound, Unbounded do, like the research certainly sets you apart, right? I don't know enough, you know, I've, I've not dove into the, the, the past pipeline with you, nor have we ever done the exercise of all of all the deals that got done in the market while we've been actively investing, have we seen, you know, 90% of them and one, you know, most of the ones that we've gone after, which would be the marker, the KPI for the way that that unbounded has showed up in the market so far. Yeah, well, a lot, a lot of thoughts are coming up, but I'll, I'll let you continue on with the, uh, the presentation and maybe you can and circle back on some of these things near the end or, or offline just before continuing anyone else uh like to jump in here and i see a couple new faces today um if you'd like to speak right now you're by default muted so just you know type in the chat the question you have or you can do the, the little hand raise thing by clicking um clicking the three dots and click and raise your hand and then i'll know to unmute you as well okay Shall I move? Let's move on. Okay. So the next thing I like to share with, um, with these entrepreneurs is that, again, the way that VCs position themselves is, you know, they see the best deal flow and they have this ability, this judgment, this process that surfaces who the winners are. And they, they, they whether that is true or that is a fiction, it's something that that the marketing communicates and it has to. But the fact of the matter is, is that I can be, you know, the best picker on the planet, but because my industry really is controlled by the next fundraising that's going to happen after I invest, timing is worth a lot. Momentum is worth a lot. And I know, you know, Unbounded has pretty sophisticated L LPs and potential LPs in terms of understanding what momentum is versus what fundamental is. Most entrepreneurs don't actually understand this. So the way that I sort of explain it to them is simply by saying, you know, look, if, if at the beginning of COVID lockdown, you invested in Zoom and Peloton, you were momentum investing regardless of whether you ever looked at um, the financial statements. So what momentum really controls is what should I invest in? 
this ends up allowing the entrepreneur a bit of uh, control in creating a narrative, which is why you see so many entrepreneurs um, uh, resorting to using buzzwords that in theory allow them to say, look, I'm playing part of this AI momentum or this blockchain momentum or this clean tech momentum or whatever it is. But momentum generally controls what a VC is going to invest in, certainly how they frame their thesis to their LPs. Um, and I try and break that down as follows. I said, look, every, every VC out there sees hundreds, if not thousands of deals. I would look at somewhere on the order of three to 4,000 deals every six months to pick my 10 investments. And so they need a framework by which to filter some of these deals and decide which ones do they want to invest the time and energy to get to know, to do due diligence on, and potentially to actually write a check to. And this is one of the frameworks out there. It's certainly not the only one. I'm not claiming it's the best, but it's a really easy one to wrap your mind around. The five T's. Trends, which is all about momentum, is okay, how do you frame how big this market is? How is this going to company, you know, is it enough to support multiple companies doing 100 million revenue a year or more? And then the second part of that is what has happened recently? Like not, not six months ago, not over the last couple of years, but rather what has happened recently that make this the right time to invest in this um, segment, in this, in this market trend? And I wanna, I wanna dive into that a little bit further. Um, Entrepreneurs, you know, when they go and they try and size their market, they do a bottoms up or they do a, a, a tops down and they try and come up with some number that really doesn't say much about anything except hopefully their understanding of who their customer is. Rather, it's societal trends or technology trends, big changes that make the difference in whether a company can generate uh, is working in a market with momentum. And their understanding that will help with finding that momentum and capturing it and having wins in their sales. So these are some of the things that often an entrepreneur can tie themselves to. And often you see um, a VC wrapping their thesis around. It could be the growth of customers. For example, millennials using... Now going to enabling tech, mobile devices. Um, when I raised my fund at 500 Startups, our thesis was financial services for the rest of us. And what we said was, today there's a billion, and in a few years, there'll be three and a half billion people around the world using these devices, but without access to formal financial services. And we're going to invest in companies that bridge that gap. There might be a growing problem, climate. Um, I've done one investment into a company that was solving the problem of GDPR, so privacy data management in Europe, and they happened to launch um, just a few months before the mandate went into effect in May 2019, and they used that problem and that uh, personally chief data governance officers would have to, uh, would be personally liable for failures in privacy mandates. Um, they use that to great effect to generate a lot of customers really quickly and demonstrate momentum. And then you can talk about, well, what's the scale and the growth of spending around one of these ideas? So these are things that entrepreneurs need to be thinking about when they're thinking about not just why, but why right now? And I'm going to take this down to a specific example that happened early in, um, in uh, COVID lockdown. Uh, the, the particular business addresses fraud in e-commerce. And so what they said, right, or what they re recognized that upon COVID lockdown happening, e-commerce made more market penetration gains in eight weeks than it had in the prior 
10 years. This is a classic sort of why now is the right time to be doing something. So we could look at the facts that because of COVID-19, there's been all this market penetration that retailers who for the most part haven't been really online other than the Amazons and the Shopify's, like they've heard about this AI thing and they really know they don't want to suffer from fraud, that the amount of money that can be generated saving just a small percentage of fraud every year is astronomical. So 1% of fraud savings in a single year would be 300 million. That's a pretty substantial profit pool for companies that are getting started to go after. So it's not when X technology or X customers get to a certain point, it's we've got momentum going into this amazing profit pool right now. So this particular company came up with this way of talking about themselves, that they were the easiest way for e-commerce merchants to maintain margins, because as software is each retail, retailers, the average retailer simply can't compete with what Amazon and Shopify are spending on technology. So they're always gonna be behind in terms of fraud management, which means their margins are always gonna be worse. Great fraud prevention means you protect your margins without making the customer experience horrible. And our company, which has amazing fraud management, is very easy to install. And we have this built-in network effect where every merchant that we install um, helps our algorithms get better and better and better, which is the only way that you would be able to keep compete with Amazon's technology. The net result of this narrative was this, these guys raised 205 million in about six weeks, which if any of you have gone out to try and raise venture capital is lightning fast. So when we're, now this is sort of the transition to what excites me about Unbounded, which was helpful to, to do at, uh, at the summit. Um, when we think about momentum around Unbounded's um, thesis of micropayments and what it's beginning to do to target that thesis even more towards FinTech and gaming, these are the kinds of numbers, the kinds of momentum that you're dealing with. That even though it seems like FinTech has gone a long way and was you know, one of the um, top performing asset classes of the, of the last eight years or sub-asset sub classes, and that even though you've seen um, uh, FinTech valuations fall in the public markets pretty much further than any other uh, micro segment, all of that activity 400 and some odd billion dollars of revenue a year, or, or sorry, market cap, represents only 2% of financial services globally. And we're going to see, especially as we go into the ideas of digitalizing traditional financial assets and the efficiencies that you can gain there, um, we're going to see a lot more fintech coming into, um, into play. And really, it's all going to be based on having uh, a, a declining cost uh, asymptotically towards zero of clearing and settlement of payments, which can be done with micropayments, but can't be done by any traditional payment network today. Um, secondly, gaming and all the business models that you can create uh, around gaming Um Right now, the largest gaming companies are, that are out there, folks like Fortnite or um, haven't really bridged into this too much, but like the, the recent finally approval of the acquisition by Microsoft of, of um, um, now I'm forgetting who it was, forgive me. Um, micropayments enables new revenue streams in gaming that you can't otherwise get access to because the ultimately the total size of the transactions are so small you can't use a credit card to do that advanced gaming companies like a Fortnite have built their own systems from scratch to do this um, but every other gaming company out there doesn't have it 
and that you can build infrastructure on top of micropayments is what's going to allow it. And then finally, for example, if any of you have been watching, uh, the U.S. Fed finally implemented um, uh, the U.S.'s real-time rail system uh, for payments. We've seen uh, payment rails around the world do this. Visa and MasterCard are improving theirs. And what you see going on with this idea is that, again, the, the value that you can generate in terms of, of transaction fees for clearing and settling a payment are driving asymptotically towards zero. But when you are able to include rich data with a payment, a payment payload, what you're able to do things is like auto reconciliation, lending on the back of certain payment streams that are not possible otherwise. So you're seeing that payments uh, market caps for companies that, that implement real-time payments are also going through the roof. Um, so the fact that to me, Unbounded is playing into all of these trends is what actually it's, excites me about the thesis and the platform that um, Zach and team have built to date anchored initially on BSV, but the specialization of doing things with micropayments is something that will translate to which of whichever payment rails or payment infrastructure ultimately wins in, in the market over the next 10 years. And that's where I will stop. Okay, well, thank you, Mike.